Good morning. Good morning. And welcome again. I'm glad this congregation is hosting this workshop. I wish more did. I know uh, when I was a teenager in 1967, I lost my grandma. And we were pretty close. But uh, for 34 years, I lived off without the loss of a loved one. I had preached 15 years uh, as gospel preacher, being there, doing a lot of funerals. I thought I knew, but I didn't have a clue what it was like. So until my mother died, 2001, lost my father, 2002, and my wife in 2004. So, boy, it all, it all came together. And uh, it's a process that if you don't know, it can, you can really approach grief the wrong way, delay things. And so uh, I don't claim to be an expert with the things I've learned along the way, and I'm thankful this congregation is hosting this for the members here and others who've come from other congregations and from the community and for those who will get on line and be able to, to grow from these things. In Job 14, verse 1, it says, Man who's born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. <laughs> That's a pretty sad way to look at life. Life is full of joy. A lot of things. We've been made in the image of God. We find that out in the first chapter. <clears throat> and because we are, we have this great capacity to love and be loved. And because of that, all well, life can be great. To be with loved ones, parents, brothers, sisters, wives, spouses, children. To go through life together and to be able to learn, especially as a child of God, to the riches and the depth of love. But you can't have this great capacity to love and then have those earthly relationships end without paying a price. It hurts. And so you can't have, as I remember one writer said, you can't have the sun without the shadows. And so what do you do? As Tom mentioned, probably almost every, everyone here has probably gone through grief to a certain extent, except some of those young folks so if I can say something along the way that will help you, sometimes people say, you know, you never get over the loss of a loved one. You learn to work around it. And so I appreciate you doing what you're doing and uh, some lessons learned. It's the dawn of time. Mankind has been wrestling with the question of, you know, why bad things happen. Why would a loving God put us on this earth and have so much sorrow with it? There are reasons for that, and I'm sure many of you know a lot of reasons, and we'll look at some of those reasons today. But uh, today, basically, there are two questions I want to answer. And first of all, or look at, you have to acknowledge, first of all, the value of trials and the tears that come from those trials on this earth. And secondly, to, some things you can do to help overcome that. And so that's pretty much the way I want to approach today. First of all, what can be learned from the sorrow and the tears? I hope you have your Bibles with you. Some I'll just verses I'll refer to, but Second uh, Corinthians chapter four, verses sixteen through eighteen is a valuable passage to help to strengthen our faith and explain the, the process of what we are to be about here on this earth. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Then notice this next verse. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. And before we comment on that, I want to combine another reading, First Peter chapter 1. So it's basically the same thing in intent and purpose. And then we'll make some comments. Beginning in verse 3, 1 Peter chapter 1, we find <clears throat> out about, about the great mercy and the living hope that we have and the inheritance, and it's described. And then in verse 5, Peter writes, Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Trials and the sorrow that come from that can help us grow and intended to help us grow. Your life, in essence, is about, as a Christian, growing and learning. There are things that you may be able to grasp with your mind, 
But until the storms come, you can't really learn it in your heart. I remember the first day of the School of Preaching when I was a tender 19-year-old. They started the School of Preaching at Carnes in 1971. In the spring, I came in the fall. It's a wonder they kept school open there after that first crew came through there. But I remember praying through there. I was so tickled to death. I'd grown up at Carnes. I'd been given a lot of opportunity to, to preach. You know, every three months you have that five, that fifth Sunday where the young men get up. And I was always, always one enough, stupid enough to say yes, well, mature enough to say yes and so forth. But I'd learned a lot. And, you know, the, the desire to preach was in my heart by the time I was a 15, 16-year-old kid. But the, the, the misconception I had at the time was, even though I could quote the book of James, you know, count it all joy, my brethren, all that kind of stuff, I, I could quote the book of James as a 16-year-old. I mean, I was in the, in the Word. But for some reason along the way, I thought, you know, uh, being a gospel preacher would protect me from all that other stuff. That's not the way it works. Well, when I prayed that prayer, the Lord turned up the heat. And before I left school, my life had turned into a mess. Some bad decisions I made, but, you know, there were people close to my heart that forsook me and fled. It just, I'm going to get in all that. But, boy, it was a, I woke up in the Navy for, with a 10-year commitment, basically, later on. But I, my misconception was why all this? I, I know the scriptures. I, I had an understanding here, but I didn't have it here. I left the church completely. I know that's kind of a surprise for people. But I was the prodigal son. And I remember uh, I was in the Navy, stationed up in uh, uh, Massachusetts, going to a nuclear power prototype. And uh, from time to time, my conscience would bother me. I'd slip into church somewhere. I knew what time they started after they started, so I wouldn't have to talk to anybody. You know, I would slip out before you know, the closing song or prayer, so I wouldn't have to talk to anybody. But for some reason, I don't know. Maybe God knows. I stayed around a little while, and the preacher, he must have been part detective and bird dog because he found out where I lived. I wouldn't fill out the card that had the address, but I mentioned where I stayed down to, you don't know, northern Connecticut, but these lakes and the, next to some old bar. And Tuesday night, that guy, after a lot of door knocking, found my house. And uh, I told him a little bit about things, but uh, he realized there was a problem there. And for the first time since I had left the church, he pulled out of me what was going on. And I said, it's not fair. Not fair, all the stuff that's going on. A lot of things, family, a lot of things, you know, I didn't do. It's just being, being a part of life in storms. You know, you know, the, you know how the book, of, you know how the Sermon on the Mount ends, don't you? Matthew 5, 6, and 7 talks about the parable of the two builders. It didn't say if storms come. It says when they come, and they will. They will come because these storms activate our faith. It gives us the opportunity to put into practice these things that we've at least intellectually grasped here. And I told him my story, tears running down my face about how mean God had been to me, loading up my life with all those issues. He told me a story of an old mule that this farmer had. You know, if I know Brian and Don have heard this story so many times. And thank her for the introduction, brother. But he told the story of this old mule that this farmer had. For He had a, a friend who was also a neighbor, a farmer, but he'd been wanting this plot of ground from this farmer for years and finally sold it to him. Not long after he secured the property, he put the mule out to pasture uh, one morning, and along about noon, looks up there, can't find the mule anywhere. He thought, that's strange because the fence is still up. And uh, that pasture had never been used for animals, and he starts walking there towards the center of that pasture, and he hears a sound. And it sounded like some animal hurting or wounded. And he goes out there, and what had happened, the ground was soft, and this mule had fallen down into an old abandoned well. And he didn't like it. I know I'm not a farmer. I don't know what kind of sound a mad mule makes, but there was a mad mule who wanted out of that hole. And the farmer, not quite as compassionate as probably the mule wanted to be, he said, well, you know, it's an old mule, Going to have to fill up the hole anyway. To just go get the wagon loads of dirt and, and fill up the, the hole here and, and bury the old mule. That mule did not like that plan at all. And they began to put one shovel full of dirt after another into that hole. And uh, the, the mule kept stomping and snorting and making whatever sound a mad mule makes. And hour after hour, the, those shovelfuls of dirt went in. And by sundown, they filled up that old abandoned well. And the mule stepped out on level ground. And the moral of the story was that which was intended to bury him was the very means by which he arose and says, Bill, you're the mule. 
and offer just somebody 24 years old, you've gone through a lot. God must have a lot of good lined up for you to do. He doesn't hate you. He's preparing you for a great work. Get busy. And that was the first day of the road back. Trials are intended for a purpose, to strengthen our faith, to enlarge our faith, to increase our faith, and to learn those things that we need to learn here if we're going to fit in to heaven. Anybody remember the movie Sleepless in Seattle? That cute little boy, Jonas, you know, his first girlfriend, he didn't like. Remember those story, they're going to the airport, you know, so forth, and he's giving a hard time. So listen, all I'm doing is dating. I'm not marrying her. That's what grown-ups do. They, they date each other to see whether or not they fit. And really, in essence, this life is all about whether or not we fit. We'll fit into heaven. And if you learn these lessons, you'll eventually see what heaven's about. And you wouldn't want to be in any other place. And your mindset would be, Lord, whatever you want me to do, make me, shape me, mold me into an instrument of your peace. And sorrow carves the deep hole into the human hearts. But once the lessons are learned of sorrow, it's replaced by a deep well of God's joy. That's the first thing I want you to know. Those trials were for a reason. Trials and sorrow cause this world to look a lot less attractive than it is. Turn with me, if you will, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Face Hall of Fame. Right out of the gate, we're introduced to some great people, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah. And then in verses 13 down to verse 16, there's kind of a, a, an interlude there, kind of a stop. And uh, let, Let's look around and see where we are. And something made that was consistent with, with all of these great characters who had been mentioned and who would be. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declared plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they'd have had the opportunity to return, but now they desire a better. It is a heavenly country, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a, a city for them. This world is not my home I'm. Boy, I tell you, wouldn't it be great if it was more than a song? If it was the reality of where our heart is. To know that we really are just pilgrims here. But one of the greatest, well, I've been preaching now 36 years, no, just enough to be dangerous, as some people say. But you know, we get this life to make the preparation for the one to come. But what's so sad is all the Christians even that are so embedded in the concrete of this world. The verses are there, but in their heart, they don't live there. They're still here. You might remember the movie Shawshank Redemption? Brooks, remember the old guy who spent his, pretty much his whole adult life in prison, and then he had flat time. He got, you know, all the years, and uh, time to go, and he didn't want to go. I tried to commit a crime just so he wouldn't have to go, but he went out anyway. He didn't fare very well. Remember that? Working as a, a tenant there in the grocery store, and after a short period of time, he hung himself. And there are the two main characters in the movie afterwards saying what happened, and uh, Red said he was institutionalized. The only world he knew was that side of the prison wall, the other side he didn't know enough about. This is his life. And brethren... Too many people are institutionalized in this world. But grief and sorrow is intended to help pave the way and plow the way to greater understanding. This world can get pretty rotten. People can be so mean. And I see why now some of the uh, gospel preachers who were mentors to me early on were ready to go. You know, I, I used to be someone who devoured. I, I read fast. I would read two or three newspapers a day. <laughs> I stopped reading newspapers a long time ago. It's so depressing. I, I don't even have a TV that I call my own. I, I found out enough about what's going on, but I get sick and tired of hearing how mean this world is and all the heartbreaks of all the children and the families that are torn apart by, by drugs and addiction and sin. I can see why. 
people who've lived life a while say, yeah, I'm ready to go. And to, and then to think and to know what the Bible says about heaven, to know what's there and what's not there, it's home. It's home. And sorrow will help you understand that's the truth about things when you get tired of the sin and the death of this world. Trials and sorrows can also pull us closer. And back to the Lord, Psalm 1971, it's good for me that I've been afflicted that I may learn your statutes. You know, and there's some passages that early on didn't make a lot of sense. Turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Here's a passage when I first started preaching. I thought, it didn't make a bit of sense. I can, maybe I can stretch my mind and conceive some of it, but here's what it says, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2. Better to go to the house of mourning than go to the house of feasting. What? For that's the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of, of mirth. I've done enough funerals people who were ready and people who were not. You can't do those without realizing that divine appointment. It's appointed a man who wants to die, and after that, the judgment. One day they're going to have my funeral. One day there'll be men stand up and say, let me tell you about Bill's life and so forth, and so that's a, that's a sobering thing. You know, I help students over the last couple of days. I got a former student who's called me every day. He's, he hasn't been preaching that long. He's doing a funeral of a close friend that's now up in, up in Pennsylvania. And I sent him my best three funeral sermons. But he wants to make sure it's done right for that family. But there, there are a lot of lessons there. Because when you come to um, a house of mourning, a funeral home, or even talk about things like that, you're talking about the very essence of life. You're talking about what life is about and the values that are there. It's like a, Ryan and Don have heard me talk about this before, but, you know, imagine years ago, before they had all the barcodes, imagine a bunch of teenagers going to a mall and going to a place like Sears or Penny's and changing all the price tags around. Wouldn't that be a mess? You know, here's a mower, $19.99, that's now $29.95. That'd be good. Here's a roll of toilet paper that's $114. I mean, that'd be bad. But how would you fix that? Well, somebody, that there'd have to be somewhere, some book that had the, the prices. See, here's what it cost. This is the price book, brethren, of the things in this world that are most valuable. And sorrow, house of the morning, can teach you pretty quick what's most valuable. I never heard anybody say as they faced it, boy, I tell you, I wish I spent more time golfing <laughs> or fishing. The thing just spent a lot of time. It's always to regret for Spent more time with my family, my kids, my Bible, church, and my God. But sorrow and grief is a wake-up call, what the essence of life is all about in, in this whole world. After Nancy died, the book of Psalms, at the recommendation of some preacher friends, became a relief, because like most people, why did this have to happen to her? She was only 52. 16-year-old girl, 20-year-old girl still at home. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And the thoughts weren't always positive. That's what happens. That's the reason why grief comes, why the sorrow comes to, to learn in the midst of the fog when you open up the scriptures what life is all about. And somebody said, and what they said was true. I wore out the Psalms. I got books that would describe the essence of each psalm. Because what I wanted to do is replace the negative thoughts I had about God or why has all this happened to me with great thoughts about God. And that's what Psalms is full of. Great thoughts about a great and awesome God that we still serve. Psalm 63. One of my favorite psalms. Here's David. Bounty on his head by King Saul. He'd won the fame of all the people of Israel, or outdid Saul. And now Saul wanted to kill him. But while he was on the run, well, he prayed a lot. He got close to God and made this, this amazing statement in Psalm 63, beginning in verse 1. Oh, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you 
and a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Notice what he said. He's on the run, him and his men. He'd gone down to the Philistines, wanted to act like a crazy man, <laughs> try to find some relief and some help. But he found his help was from the Lord. You're my God. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches because you've been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. I learned what he was thinking about there. I don't know if my faith will ever get to the point, but his, his was. He was a man after God's own heart. But I grew up in my faith. Rebecca, my oldest daughter, asked a question before we went to Nashville. My wife died of leukemia. We spent six months at Vanderbilt. She asked me, Dad, is Mama going to make it, even though the doctor said 30 40% chance she'd survive the transplant, that it would work? So, yeah, that's enough to go. I said, honey, I can guarantee you she's going to make it. And she said, how can you be so sure? Because I believe anybody's supposed to be a gospel preacher. It's me. There was no way I could ever make it without that girl. She found me when I left the church, and through the Lord's use of her life, brought me back in the church, got me beefed up, encouraged, and what a soul mate she was. And I said, everything good in my life has been, she's been right there. By, my dad called her my scotch because, you know, I, you know, I have the tendency to run. You know what scotch is. You put it behind the back wheels, keep from backing up. I said, that's your scotch, son. You hit the mother low when you got her because she was there through a lot of dark times in my life. And I said, there's no way I can make it without her. And so if God wants me to preach what she does, then she's going to have to stay alive. That may sound very romantic, but that's not faith talk. I had to learn to make a life without her. And God provided. I learned more about prayer while going through the sorrow, grief, than any other portion of my life. I taught a lot of lessons on prayer. Some lessons I can get up now, use the basic outline, but I learned more about prayer than any other time of my life. And by the time the worst was over, I knew what it was to be able to say, I can do all things through Christ who strength. As long as I've got the Lord, I don't have to own any earthly thing. I never learned that without having the opportunity to walk with sorrow for the four or five years of, of my life. What can we do to overcome the sorrows? It's a second major point. Here it is. First John 5, verse 4. But whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. That's what it's all about. Hebrews 11 is there for a reason. The book of Hebrews is about faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 6, without it, it's impossible to please God. And you cannot grow your faith just reading this book. There are going to be things that will happen where you can learn to put these things into practice and see it really works. And so faith is there. Hebrews chapter 11 again, we normally read the first part, maybe stop some of us down at the, we talk about Moses, but let's look at the end of the chapter. Some of the heroes of the faith for what their faith enabled them to do, beginning of verse 32. What more shall I say for the time would fall, fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, Samson, Jephthah, also of David and Samuel, the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, had a weakness, were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Their faith kept them there. 
You think there were any tears and sorrow associated with all these things they had to face? Sure, and God allowed them to do that. But when their life was over, when the angels were commissioned to carry their soul to the other side, what a wonderful existence they saw and see this very day through the eye of faith. Initially, as I told many people, when you lose a loved one, for a while the view is going to be behind of things you did with that person that you love and that you miss dearly. But after a while, people of faith, perspective changes not from where you were and what you did to forward. The first time when I when thought of Nancy comes to my mind or my mom and dad who are faithful members at Carnes, I don't think of them there. I think of them up there. I think about the joy of being in paradise in Abraham's bosom in the presence of the Lord. I wouldn't bring them back to this world for anything. There's times I wish I could talk to them. Going through things with my daughter, went to the cemetery the other day. Said she's having some issues. Talk with you, Mom. I know she's not here. But this is a place where maybe you can open up your mind and your heart and your tears and know and remember. But people of faith... That's where they look. First Corinthians chapter 15 meant a whole lot to me, the resurrection chapter, after I buried my mom and my dad and my wife than it ever did preaching before. And I thought I had some pretty good lessons. And I did, and I do. But faith changes everything. We walk by faith and not by sight. One day we'll see. But there's enough there now, enough here now, to know with blessed assurance we may not know what the world holds, but we know the one who holds the future. That's a, the same. But it's reality. It's who you are. It's what you think about. What can we do to overcome the sorrows? <laughs> Line the blessings and the sorrows, as I mentioned. You know, that old mule. There are so many things to learn. Th- things that we think that we want. And I'm sure you've all heard this story, but I keep it close by. It's the prayer of a Confederate soldier. I ask for strength and I might achieve I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wiser. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. But I was given weakness that I might feel the need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. But I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for. But everything that I'd hoped for, almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I'm among all men most richly blessed. Well, you can learn when you walk with sorrow some of the greatest lessons in all the world. Number three, overcome the trials and the sorrow. Run to the church, not away from it. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, and one member suffers. All the members suffer with it. Second Corinthians chapter 1 is a great passage that I understood far more after 2004 than I did before. Second Corinthians 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us, notice the process, who comforts us in all our tribulation, <clears throat> that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with a comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For our, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. When I see that on that Monday, I was going to quit for you. Fire in my belly of God, because I always thought, she was going to get well. She would be the one story of victory. Everybody at Vanderbilt loved her. She never complained. But somebody told me before I went there, I said, Bill, if you watch, you'll see more expressions of the love of God while you're there than any other period of your life. And they were right. The church showed up for me. I could tell the rest. I could take the whole four hours and go another four hours. I could go to midnight. But all the things that I saw, there's Celeste back there. 
He said, you can't quit now. Preach a little while longer. It'll be all right. And she'd write those little notes that I'd read. I'd pull them out before I got up there. There'd be notes afterwards. Just hang on a little bit longer. Hang on. I know you want to hang on a little bit longer. I'm thankful she was there. She was God's answer. Until the fire was relit, she was there. While there, there's a guy by the name of Nathan. He was a doctor. He was a resident in internal medicine there at at Vanderbilt. About halfway through our six months there, he was assigned to us. Tall young man. Boy, he had such a caring spirit. I thought, man, the only thing about him, but this guy's good. And he kind of adopted us, kind of like his parents. And even though he didn't have to do that, almost every day before he'd go, he'd come and see us. A burnout, you know, leukemia ward, just to say hi, see how we were doing. In July of that year, Nancy's lungs began to fail. They tried everything over the course of the weekend to help her get better. On a Monday morning at 8 o'clock, Dr. Jagesia called me in and said, Bill, she's not going to make it. Do the right thing. Let her go. Don't make her suffer. Well, there's other things we could try, but let her go. And that young man was there. Spent pretty much the afternoon with me. He felt so sorry for me. I thought, boy, if this guy does that for everybody, it'd be something. And so I went to bed that night. She's now she not expecting to see her alive the next morning, but she was. And that young man met me with a smile on my face and said, I know who you are. I thought, well, you've been my doctor for six weeks. What do you mean I know who you are? I know who you are. I called my parents last night to tell them about you and Nancy. They know you. It's Tim Hall, the preacher at Johnson City. I knew Joyce when she was a teenager. I went to school of preaching with her brother Ron Edwin. He was their son. No wonder he was such a good guy. And for the remaining two months that we were there, he was there. God's answer, the church Showing up for me, as it always has, when you look for it and pray for it. And so, one of the things that God would hope us, that we would learn, why me is asked so often a negative. Why has all this happened to me? There's a book you've probably seen, Why Has All This Happened to Us? W.T. Hamilton wrote that book. And he had, from the time he was a young man, a gospel preacher, helped a lot of people. Dealing with sorrow and grief. And somebody said, write this down. Write it in a book. And while he was writing the book, he found out he had terminal cancer. Boy, that's a great way to finish the book. He's getting to live out what he's going to tell everybody else. And it was a wonderful, wonderful book. And, and he was the one who first suggested the idea, ask why me in, in a positive way. Why has the Lord been so good to me? Why was I privileged in 1960 to move out to Carnes? We've been going to a large denomination church in Magnolia Avenue. But why was Arnold Moore there to invite us to church? And why would the people in Carnes for five years, when my father ever woke up spiritually, carry us to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night, Wednesday, all the things down through the years that God sent my way through the church, through Christians, to tell me this, Bill, I love you. I've got great plans for you. Like, do, like in the book of Jeremiah. I, I've got hope for you. Just give me all your heart. And he has. Sorrow is a wonderful pain can be instructive if you look for it. And look for the things that God has done that are expressions of his love and grace and, and mercy. We're being fitted for heaven. How strong is that hope in <clears throat> your life? I'll close with this story of a mentor of mine. When I, I went to the school of preaching, lasted for about four months, ended up in the Navy, as I told you. Lost my name. It was William Bill, named after my dad. But my dad had given me a new name when he found out I joined the Navy. Submarine Jonah was my new name. Hoping somewhere along the way that submarine would spit me out on dry ground. I'd be ready to preach. And that's exactly what happened. Sent me to Cincinnati, and six or seven months later, there's a guy named Tim who finished work on his doctorate degree and sent the church of about 140, 150, and he was leaving, and the elders, five of them, came by and said, we want you to preach to me. <laughs> you got to be kidding. 
I was scared. You think I'm scared and talk fast? No, you have no idea how fast I could talk about them, but they taught me into doing it. And then L.B. Meese was his name, my guardian angel, so to speak, a retired preacher in his mid-70s. He lost his wife a couple of years before. He said, I have no idea why God's kept me around. And after I started preaching and making a fool of myself, I said, I know why, because you've got to help me or they're going to run me off. He helped me get the first funeral sermon for a non-Christian. He was always there. I don't know how often, day and night, I call and say, LB, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? He was my mentor, and he loved the Lord. And he knew that Bible. He preached for 40-something years. He had always preached along the side. Churches in Ohio and Kentucky and Michigan always been there. Well, he was there. Moved to Knoxville, went back four years later. He was in failing health. One morning he fell. The neighbors found him out the sidewalk close to his house. He'd fallen. By the time they scoped him out of the hospital, they found out he had liver cancer. He was going to die. Wouldn't make it four or five or six months. He called me to come see me. He said, Bill, I don't want to live six more months. Is it okay to pray to die now? I said, you're asking me? I know you'll figure it out. And about four or five days later, they found a nursing home over uh, about 20 miles outside of town, and there they sent him. Saw him a time or two, and then on a Wednesday afternoon, his mother, his daughter called and said, LB wants to see you. <clears throat> they said, he won't make the night. I said, he's a, I thought he won't make the night. And I drive out there, remember this. Sorrow cuts deep into the heart of a Christian and the wells of joy can fill it up. And I saw a man in all my years before and since, I never saw a man that was as ready to die. I get to die tonight, Bill. I get to be with Edith now. I get to be with my precious Lord tonight. And the tears of joy from that well of knowledge, God's tears, were those tears of joy. I never saw a man who faced death like that. I envied him. He learned after a walk of years of sorrow what sorrow can carve out in his heart. And that heart, that hole, was filled with the joys of God. And he could not wait to die. And I prayed for him. I prayed for me as I left that he could give me such faith. And by the time I got back the 45 minutes to the other side of town, it was a Wednesday night, got a call from his daughter, he's gone. I thought, man, how rich I have been blessed to see a man look at life and death. He wasn't afraid. Sorry I had carved out a great possession for him. And I'm sorry I can do that if you fill it up with the blessings and faith that comes from the Word of God. Deuteronomy 32. Verse 10. This was Nancy's verse. She found in the reading one of her devotions is the hospital in Vanderbilt. I'd never noticed it. Deuteronomy is two or three long sermon discourses to the nation that had been 40 years in the wilderness, and Moses was trying to explain what it was all about. There's a lot of pronouns in this word, in this verse. He found him, God found Israel in the desert land, in, in the wasteland, a, a howling wilderness. God encircled Israel. God instructed Israel and kept him as the apple of his eye. And as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone led Israel. You may ever see in a sign that says Eagle Flight Training School. Eagles don't build their nest on the ground, do they? Where do they build those nests? Way up high. And when those eagle birds get, whatever you call them, eagles, when they get old enough, the mom bird said, it's time to learn how to fly. And she'll take that little eagle up high, and you know what she's going to do? Drop it. And then gravity takes over, 32 feet per second, even for birds. 
They got to learn to flap those wings, flap, flap. They're going to hit the ground. When the mother eagle has this amazement to fly down and, and pick it up and get it back in the nest, if it hasn't learned through lesson number one, I wonder what eagle bird number one says to eagle bird number two. You're going to hate this. But God made eagles to fly. And the same is true as us. God didn't make us to grovel along the ground. God made us capable of having a faith that enables us to fly. Great things. There's storms in every kind of, in store, every kind of uh, situation that may befall us in life for our good and His glory. May God be the glory. Great things He's done. I've gone over a couple of minutes. I'll open it up for your questions if you have any. Man, that went fast, Tom. Questions? Bill, do you think that maybe in Greek there's a guilt? A guilt some of that too? You know, if you look at the stages of the guilt, guilt is one of the hardest. I've never known anyone that I've talked with that didn't have a regret over what they perhaps could have said or did better than what they did. That's the way it works. Guilt comes. But you know what the cure of that is? The scriptures. When I talk with someone that deals with that, I, I think about Peter. Remember the night that the Lord said, all of you are going to betray me, forsake me, flee. And what Peter said, no, no, not, not I. Peter, this night with the cockroach, you'll deny me three times. And later on, after the resurrection, he meets with Peter. Remember the question he asked him, Peter, do you love me? And what did he say? Well, you know, go through the Greek won't do that. But what did the Lord say every time? Feed my sheep. I told somebody not the other day. It was good to grief. Regret of what they should have said and should have done. If that person was here today, what would she tell you? You'd say, take care of your sister. <laughs> take care of your family. Stay in church. Now, and that's what I think the Lord wants us to see. There, there are things we can't do, but helping go through the grieving process to tell people, like Hebrews 11, 4, Abel, though dead, he still speaks. You want to keep your mom alive in your heart? Do what she would want you to do. The things she stand for, I, I think she'll figure it out. And so when people are struggling with grief, I tell them, you can't go back and change it. They've died and gone on. I guarantee you. They have the chance to come back and talk to you a little while about And you ask them, what would you have me to do, Mama? Do them now. I guarantee you'll get to the grieving process a lot easier. Doing what you can do. How does 1 Corinthians 15 end? Be a steadfast, immovable, always a bound with knowing that your labor is not in vain of the Lord. And so you can't, you can't go back and I wish you had, you can't change that. But you can sure do in the future, what you would have, could have, should have done before. If you get through that grieving process, the guilt process, a lot of you I believe it was a great question. The question was, how do you handle the grief? How do you handle the, the guilt that comes? Because it'll come. Other questions? Yes, sir. I thank you for your time, Tom and the elders. This has been a, it's a great workshop.